know. Sometimes, honestly, I get caught, like freezing point elevation, boiling point depression. I get caught with that stuff because I'm trying to be over helpful and I make a mistake. So it could be a mistake. If the literature says Henry's Law constant is a lowercase and the freezing point depression and boiling point elevation constants are an uppercase, I would go with literature. But, you know, there are a lot of things we put together just on the fly to try to kind of be helpful. So, um, I guess. And the negative I missed, but that's kind of a little more honest because sometimes they don't have a negative with the equation. I missed it in the lab. So I try. So I don't know if it's capital or lowercase. So I'm going to track okay. it down. But I do know when we talk about the equilibrium constant expressions, that's a capital K. And when we talk about the, um, uh, the rate law constants, that's a lowercase k. I do know those two k's are coming up, but two more constants. important k's. They're, they're still both constants. They're constants relative to the equilibria they're talking about. Yay. Yay. Or the, uh, the reaction they're talking about, yeah. So actually, these are constants, like the boiling point elevation, the freezing point depression, those are constants relative to the solvent, right? Grr, right? But the ideal gas law constant is a constant. Which I like to think about going to another universe. Would those constants be different? I think they would. So anyway. <laughs> so what I'd like to do, this is actually finishing uh, part 12, I believe it is. We, le we lack just a little bit at the end of part 11. Um, and I'd like to hit that on Monday and then go into unit 2. So this is actually kind of back to what you guys did in the lab. Okay. This is one where... Um, like, I was looking at this just now, and I'm like, what is the freezing point of a benzene solution that boils at an elevated temperature of 82.0 degrees Celsius? You might be like, I have no idea. But you would have an idea if you were given these four pieces of information. So I'm going to show you how to work through this. So basically, benzene is the solvent. A solute has been added, but we don't care what the solute is. We only care about the molality of the solute. So I think that is so awesome. So in order to work this, and I have a table coming up, you would need to know for benzene, for that solvent, what temperature does it normally boil at? Well, the normal boiling point temperature is 80.1. Um, what temperature does it normally freeze at? 5.5. What's the, what are the constants for boiling point elevation and freezing point depression? You need to know all that. And I would give that to you. Sometimes you're like, do I need to memorize that? No. <laughs> So kind of the strategy is like this. You're going to see me work it through the problem like this. We're going to use the information it gave us about the elevated boiling point temperature to get to the molality, basically. And once we have the molality, we're going to come up with a delta TFP, the freezing point depression. Then we're going to apply that delta T freezing point depression to the temperature it normally freezes at. And voila, so kind of in three stages. So this is the table, this is the benzene. Actually, all of these numbers are what you had on the previous slide. Here we go. So starting with the elevated boiling point temperature. So delta T in this equation um, is final minus initial. So the final is the elevated temperature minus the initial temperature. So it's 82.0 minus 80.1. And sometimes you can put that in parentheses and outside the parentheses put degrees Celsius, and that works just great. We round according to decimals. So our delta T BP is 1.9 degrees Celsius. A lot of us, I'll say, I'll include myself in it, have a hard time um, making sure we do the algebra correctly. We're trying to solve for the molalis of the solute. We know K BP and delta T BP now. So the molality of the solute is delta TBP over KBP. Of course, it looks like this. Delta T, we got 1.9 degrees Celsius. The boiling point elevation constant for benzene is 2.53 degrees Celsius per molal. And our degrees Celsius will cancel. And, you know, it's all about factor label, baby. So basically what you end up with is 1 over molal in the denominator, which you bring it up, and that's the same thing as molal. So our units are great. Round to two significant figures. The molality of the solute that's hiding in there is 0.75. So now we said we're going to plot, use that molality. Now we're going to turn our attention to the freezing point depression. 
So the freezing point depression um, is negative uh, freezing times the freezing point depression constant times the molality of the solute. In this case, we know everything on the right side of the equal sign. Okay, so the delta TFP, freezing point depression, is that constant freezing point depression negative, or sorry, um, is 5.12 degrees Celsius per molal. We bring along the negative sign that's part of the equation. Times the molality we got from the boiling point elevation, 0.75 molal. The molals cancel, we're left with degrees Celsius, which is awesome. So delta TFP is negative 3.8 degrees Celsius. You have a couple of ways to do this last step, but however you do it, you need to show everything. So if you put it in your calculator, even if you do it in your head, show this little calculation. What I would do is go back to what does delta TFP mean? It means um, the, the, um, the final minus initial. So this is the depressed, excuse me, yeah. This is the depressed temperature, and this is the temperature that it normally freezes at. So we are solving for the depressed temperature. So we are solving for T. So if we rearrange that, T is equal to delta T, which is negative 3.8, plus the temperature it usually freezes at, which is T naught. Makes sense? So then the temperature, um, at the depressed temperature, is equal to negative 3.8 plus 5.5, what it usually freezes at. We round according to decimals, and we end up with a uh, 1.7 degrees Celsius. As I was working this today, I think it's interesting the different chemistry problems that you have to go to the Kelvin temperature scale. Gases, Kelvin, how did you Kelvin? All of these delta T's, as long as you stay metric or, I think you could, I'm trying to say if you can even go Fahrenheit if you wanted to, but you don't have to do it in the Kel absolute temperature scale. I think that's neat. So that's the answer. Not too bad. We're going to do one more, and this is a classic hint, hint. Um, let me double check. So like for your test on Thursday, it simply says number seven, so I kind of don't think I threw you much of a bone. So number seven, you're going to see a question or questions related to freezing point depression boiling point elevation, and this is a classic. Anyway, with that said, um, remember yesterday in lab, I kept its lauric acid was the solvent and benzoic bad, BA, was the solute, okay, and I kind of kept calling, wanted to call it laurel acid, acid. Laurel alcohol in this case is the solute and benzene is the solvent. Okay, so sometimes when you work a freezing point depression or boiling point elevation problem, it helps to know which is which. And if you want to, what I was do, what I would do is right up the top, you know, I would go LA for laurel alcohol, and I might even for benzene, since I don't want to keep writing it out, you know, do ben or benzene or something. All right, so it describes basically, and if you draw a diagram, it becomes obvious which is which. And as I was getting ready to do this lecture from a year ago, I was like, now which is which? So notice we only have 5.00 grams of laurel alcohol, and we have a whopping 0 0.100 kilograms of benzene. Okay, so clearly the laurel alcohol is the solute, and benzene is the solvent. If you're like me, it just kind of helps feel around a problem. So the question uh, is to get to the molar mass, or mm, of laurel alcohol. Okay. Now, sometimes in my notes I'll say, well, what, is the, what are the units of molar mass? Units of molar mass are moles of La per gram. Grams per mole, darn it. Molar mass, units of molar mass are grams of laurel alcohol per mole of laurel alcohol. If we can get that ratio factor label, we have the molar mass. 
All right. So here we go. Um, we're going to go ahead and go back to that table again and pull up the freezing point. Oh, sorry. The information given was the depressed temperature at which um, this particular adulterated uh, solution freezes at. So we need to know what, the temp what temperature it usually freezes at, the normal freezing point temperature. And we also need to know the freezing point depression constant for benzene. And here they are. So this little box down here is what we'll be using. And actually, it's related to this line right here. So for your homework that's going to be due on Monday, you might be referring to this table. All right. So we're going to use the, um, it's kind of like we did with the earlier problem. We're going to use the depression we see in the freezing point temperature to get to the molality of the LA, the lauryl alcohol. Once we have the molality, then we're going to kind of go back and massage the problem, use factor label to ultimately get to grams per mole, grams of LA per mole of LA. Using the molality of the LA plus what was originally given in the problem statement. And I'll kind of show you how that works. So the molality from the depressed temperature goes like this. Our delta T is uh, 4.1 degrees Celsius. That was the depressed temperature. From that, we subtract the temperature at which it normally freezes, 5.53 degrees Celsius. Notice that in this cute little subtraction problem. We have one decimal in the first term, two decimals in the second term. We have to round according to one decimal. So we have a depressed temperature, delta T FP of negative 1.4. Now we're ready to take that delta, delta T FP, plug it in up there. Oh man. So it looks like I'm missing a negative sign. Plug it in up there. And we're going to get a positive molality, hopefully. <laughs> OK. So the molality is delta TFP divided by negative KFP. Delta T, of course, is negative, negative 1.4. Um, so your negatives cancel. And this is our degrees Celsius cancel. We're left with units of molality in the inverse of the denominator, which is the same thing as molality. Um, round to two significant figures, our molality is 0.27 molal. The next slide unpacks that, because I should never see you work a problem, factor label that just leaves it as molal. That doesn't make sense to me. 0.27 molal really means that you have 0.27 moles of LA per one kilogram of bins. Okay, molality is moles of solute per kilogram of solvent. Not bad. So the last step is somewhat kind of seems like hardcore factor label to me. Basically, we are going to um, use this and what was given in the original problem. If you go back a few slides, what was given in the original problem was we had 0 0.100 kilograms of benzene solvent. If we use that, the molality now, notice kilograms of benzene cancel, we're left with moles of LA, which is what we actually need in the denominator of molar mass. Rounding to two significant figures, the moles of um, lauryl alcohol in that particular solution was 0 0.027. Then if you look back again at the original problem, it gave us the mass of lauryl alcohol. So now we have grams of lauryl alcohol, and we already, now we have moles of lauryl alcohol. The ratio of that is actually then going to be the molar mass. So original problem said we have 5.00 grams of LA. We came up with uh, 0.027 moles of LA. That ratio will you give you grams per mole. And voila, that is the molar mass of the solute. Solute which is 180, and that's the answer. Okay, again, feel free to abbreviate. Make sure you show all your work. 
So the homework, actually, I'm taking one of those off right now. The homework will have you kind of work through that second type of problem, as well as that first. Take a quick look at these. You know, the homework, the, the hints, you know, feel free to use them or not use them. I'm not sure if I would or not. Let's see. Six, nine. This one. Okay. So there's three problems. This is the first problem. Um, notice the solute is unknown and benzene is the solvent. They say that um, the freezing point, um, it should freeze at 5.53 but the reduced freezing point temperature is 4.92. And it's just like we did with lauryl alcohol. Uh, what is the molar mass of that unknown? So down here, I kind of pulled some numbers. Uh, the, 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 you can knock out the delta TFP by taking the difference between the, what it freezes at normally and what the freezing point temperature of this particular solution is. Come back here. I just hit the wrong button. button. So once you have delta T, you can get to molality. Um, it looks like I'm missing a negative sign there. Okay. And then once you have molality, you can get to molar mass. Um, because molality is the moles of unknown per kilogram of benzene. By definition, that first term is molality. In this one, kind of unlike I did for the problem just now, I kind of did it all in one uh, fell swoop. If we recognize that in the original problem, it said that the mass of the solvent, benzene, was 75.22 grams. Um, we need to convert grams to kilograms in order to get those uh, units to cancel. I guess this is still piecewise. Um, when the dust settles here, we have moles of solute, and then I guess I do have one last division problem, just kind of like we did. Molar mass of the unknown is grams, which is 1.10 grams, divided by these moles to get the molar mass, and that's it. Uh, skip this one. I can't remember why, but I did it, skipped it last year, so we'll skip it again. Um, another problem, benzene uh, in this case is the solute. Don't blame me. Cyclohexane is the solvent. I thought it was cute since we've talked about benzene in here a little bit. Um, uh, cyclohexane is kind of like benzene in that it's got a cyclic structure, six carbons just like benzene, but it's what we call saturated. It has um, hydrogens. Basically, the green dashes are hydrogens, so it's got single bonds all over the place. It's an alkane, but that's not the point here. Um, they go ahead and they say that they observed a freezing point depression from 6.5 to 3.3 degrees Celsius. You're supposed to first knock out the freezing point depression constant for this solvent. That's not too bad. Um, you can get your delta T. But here's where you got to do something we talked about earlier in unit one. You have to knock out the, the molality of the solute, which is cyclohexane. Wait, that should be six. Wait, benzene? Oh, darn it. No. Yeah, sorry. Benzene is benzene up here. You have to knock out the molality of the benzene uh, using the molar mass and the... Um, the mass of the solvent. You guys can do that. And then once you have both of those terms, you can solve for the freezing point depression constant. So that's question for A. Question B says, what would be better if you were going to use something like you uh, use an approach to come up with the molar mass of an unknown solute like you did in the previous problem? Would you rather use hexane? Okay. Um, cyclohexane, or would you rather use benzene? And my hint was, which one gives you um, the more depression? Which one has the highest freezing point depression constant of those two acting as a solvent? It's a little bit incid incestuous. It's just a little bit kind of like, really, six carbons? Can't you find anything else? 
All right. So the last one is kind of fun. You know how we talked about if you live in at high altitudes, high elevations, and you want to force your water to um, boil at 100 degrees Celsius, if you don't force it, it's going to boil at a lower temperature. And we said now with boiling point elevation and the colligative property of adding a solute, you can do that by adding salt. But now, now I think of like macaroni and cheese, like boiling your water. Instead of adding salt like we're used to, because we're going to talk about how actually here in a minute that salt gives you actually two particles for every one um, repeating unit. What if you added sugar as a colligative, um, to use the colligative property of sugar instead of uh, salt? You sure could. So that's what we're doing. We're adding sugar to water and making it elevating the boiling point temperature. So if you read this problem a few times, basically they're describing um, a, maybe an upper um, altitude because the atmospheric pressure is not 760, it's 749.2 millimeters of mercury. As far as I can tell, you will not use that pressure. They're just telling you that it's a reduced pressure. At that reduced pressure, the boiling point, the normal boiling point temperature is not 100, it's 99.60 degrees Celsius. The problem goes on to ask, how much sucrose do you need to add to bump up, what is it, 0.4 degrees Celsius, to bump it up from 99.60 to 100 degrees Celsius? That's your question. Okay. Um, so you need to come up with um, your boiling point elevation that you're after, which I think is 0.4 degrees Celsius. Okay. Delta TBP um, is equal to the... Um, the boiling point elevation constant you get for the solvent, which is water, times the molality of the solute, in this case, sucrose. You can go ahead and you'll know delta T, you know KBP, so you can solve for the molality of the solute. Okay, then you basically need to convert molality into weight percent. Okay, and my little hint here is since molality is moles of solute, in this case sucrose, per kilogram of water, I would basically use my basis as one kilogram of water to get to weight percent. And things should fall into place pretty well. So those will be due on Monday. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and, like I said, finish up this last part, and then we'll call it a day. I'm excited about this last part because, to me, it emphasized the whole colligative nature of freezing point depression, boiling point elevation. It depends only on the number of particles. It doesn't depend on what the particles are. I think that is so cool. So I mentioned salt and sucrose, okay? So you could add sugar to your water to go ahead and, and elevate the boiling point temperature. Or you could add sodium chloride. But I'm telling you, sodium chloride actually is an ionic compound. We talked about this in Chem 1. Ionic compounds, if they are soluble, basically break apart and sodium chloride gives you an Na plus and a Cl minus. So colligatively speaking, okay, you get basically two, two bucks for your one bang. Okay? So that is so cool. That's actually what we're going to talk about here. And here it talks about the number of dissolved particles. If you had something that basically ionized or broke apart, they're the same thing. Ionized water breaks apart. Um, however many particles you get, you would expect to see that extra depression, that extra effect. I just think that is so cool. To me, it's like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. But if your compound, and actually you have homework questions along this line, if your compound is not ionic, um, sucrose, molecular compound, basically it'll dissolve, but you'll just have little sucrose molecules floating around, which goes ahead and depresses your freezing point and elevates, yeah, depresses your freezing point and elevates your boiling point, but it just stays as one little part. So here we go. Um, with um, NaCl, you get two pieces. With CaCl2, you get three pieces. And with uh, aluminum chloride, guess what? You get four pieces. Okay, I'm going to kind of show you this. This is ideally the way you think it would behave. But what we're going to see, and this kind of makes sense, and this is so cool too, that the more concentrated your solutions are, the more likely they are to kind of randomly find each other and instead of 
This is to say, instead of being these independent particles over here, they're not going to be independent. <laughs> okay? This is under the more concentrated they get. I just think that is so cool. I'll stop saying that. Okay? So um, I mentioned that uh, concentration plays a part. I'm going to, I have a, um, how do I say this? The Van Hoft uh, factor is a script I, which I didn't, oop, that's a J. A script I, I'm trying to do kind of a script I, an italics I. The Van Hoft factor actually addresses um, do you get this approaching number of particles because it ionizes. I'll show you what I mean. But across the top there, do you see where we have 1 molal, 0.1 molal, 0.01 molal, 0 .001, 0 0.001 molal? So this one over here, they're more likely to act independently. This one right here, not so much. So if we look at kind of across the board, NaCl, we expect infinitely dilute to basically get two particles for every one repeating unit you dissolve because it breaks apart in two. Um, at the most concentrated here, the best we can get is 1.81. The more dilute we get, it approaches the, what you expect. Magnesium sulfate, again, you expect two, right? Okay. Notice that it's more affected by higher concentrations. Um, the lead 2 nitrate, you would expect 3. Okay. So that's kind of what we got going on. Van Hoft factor. So this one actually is kind of showing you um, if you have uh, more concentrated versus dilute solutions. This is showing you the interaction that you don't want to happen if you're wanting to kind of get the most out of your colligative property of the ionic compound that you've dissolved. Okay, they do have some interactions. And you want them to behave independently. Okay, so the Van Hoff factor actually is a ratio of um, the observed depression. Sometimes I write observed or measured up here, okay, um, divided by um, just the normal molality, assuming no ionization. So if we have, uh, you know, a dilute solution of, uh, you know, 0 0.001 molal um, NaCl, um, that would be your apparent molality, assuming NaCl did not ionize. Um, under infinitely dilute uh, solution, actually you end up seeing a 2 up there as you're observed or you're measured. This is kind of a, there are some things in chemistry that it's kind of hard to sink your teeth into, I think. Okay, so apparent molality assumes no ionization. So again, um, here in your homework, you're going to want to differentiate between ionic compounds, which you assume are hope ionized, versus molecular compounds, which just are blobby. They may dissolve, but they're going to stay as one unit. So this actually is a new slide, because I was looking at your homework, and this will actually help. So if in the margins you have a place to put this, you recognize what this is. It's basically the first one. I'll put both of them up here. They are basically your boiling point elevation and your freezing point depression equations where I put the Van Hoft factor in front of them. Okay, so for instance, you need to kind of think of it this way, where for NaCl, In especially infinitely dilute or very dilute solutions, the Van Hoft factor is equal to 2. Okay. For that aluminum sulfate, it's equal to 3, for instance, or 4, excuse me. No, aluminum chloride, it's equal to 4. All right.
So here's the table again. So these problems, I thought about it, and actually um, these two problems and the problems we're going to get to in Unit 1 on Monday are going to be worth extra credit. It's not extra credit because it's so hard. Okay, but it's, I'm just making the extra credit this semester. Ten extra credit points, which extra credit points in here, whenever I give them, which is not very often, they only apply towards missed assignment questions or points. Let's just go ahead and get that for the record. <laughs> Students always say, well, can I take my extra credit points and put them on my test? No. <laughs> so let's take a look at those two right quick. They look like, and those I did not have from last year. But I made them new. Okay. All right, so we have several substances here. We're going to use them uh, for, to depress the freezing point temperature um, of water. In each of these cases, we are going to make the solutions 0.1 molal, 0.10 molal of each of these substances individual. We're not going to make oh, one big soup of these things. No, individuals, individuals. And we're supposed to come up with what do we think that the freezing, the the new freezing points would be by dissolving these various solutes individually in water. Well, the depression of the freezing point, that's kind of why I gave you that equation a minute ago. The freezing point depression will be equal to um, the Van Hoft factor, okay, negative Van Hoft factor, times the freezing point depression constant for water. You can look that up times the molality of the solute. In each of these cases, the molality is 0 0.10. So, let's see, did I do this? Maybe I didn't. Go back. So, for instance, I don't want to do all this for you, but I just put the asterisks next to things that do not ionize. If it does not ionize, the Van Hoff factor is 1. I just think these are so fun, though. And the van, this is ammonium nitrate, and again, go back to your Chem 1 days, where actually that breaks apart into two particles, so the Van Hoff factor would be 2, HCl, Van Hoff factor 2, calcium chloride, Van Hoff factor 3, okay, 2 for magnesium sulfate, and oh, acetic acid, we're going to assume that it basically kicks off a proton, kicks off a hydrogen, so you have the hydrogen and the acetate ions, so that's going to be 2 also. Okay, so those numbers and circles are the little subscript i. So to me, you need to come up with the delta FP and then apply that to the baseline freezing point temperature for water, which is zero Celsius. Okay, oh, are you serious? Come back here. The next one looks like this. Um, well, actually, we have two different solutions. Um, the first one, they give you the molality, and they say um, that it, uh, it freezes. This is water. Yeah, we need to like the right solutions. Um, um, so your solvent is water. Um, wait. No. So you're come, supposed to come up with the Van Hoft um, factor for both of these. Go. So um, in this case, we are going to use the observed freezing point, um, which was uh, negative point zero nine eight six divided by the freezing point you would expect if it was did not ionize um, and yeah made sense at the time <laughs> the second one is a different solution 
This one actually I need to explain more about. We talked about chemical equilibria. We talked about equilibrium in general. We can use a two-way arrow. And actually, that's kind of what we got going on here with this weak acid. We'll talk more about acids, strong acids and weak acids. But what's important is it gives you the molar concentration of the hydrogen ion. Okay, the molar concentration of the hydrogen ion is 6.91 times 10 negative third molar. But I hope you buy this, that that is the molar concentration also of the NO2 minus that also is formed at the same amount. There is a third particle, though, and that is what we call the unionized amount of HNO2. And you can get to that by taking what it started out to be, 0.100 molar, and from that subtracting the amount that did ionize. Okay, so when the dust finally settles, you actually have three particles that are causing um, a depression in the, um, causing an elevation or depression. So the three particles are your unionized HNO2, your H+, plus, and your NO2-. minus. So you'll have to add the molar concentrations of all of them together, and then to come up, up with your I, what you can do is basically take the total number of these particles and divide it by 0.1 molar, which assumes that none of it ionized. And that would work. Okay, so that one's that one. And that's it. Extra credit, baby. So that's where I wanted to get to today. So we'll see you on Monday.